Listening Post East. Now, here is John Daly. In ten short years, China has surged into the 20th century under the lash of the communists and the spur of a revived jingoistic nationalism. It has become, in this explosive decade, a monolithic force in all of Asia, taking over forcibly in Tibet, probing across India's borders, and pressuring its Southeast Asian neighbors, such as Laos and South Vietnam, with subversion and outright guerrilla raids. China, in fact, has become a world force with enough power to influence the recent collapse at the summit through its insistence on the continuation of the Cold War. China has continually made it clear to the Soviet Union that it needs, as did Russia in its formative days under Stalin, an atmosphere of tension and struggle. The West must be maintained as an ever-present menace to unify communist China's people for the drive to greater goals. Some fairly substantial goals already have been reached. The communists boast that China's world trade has been quadrupled, agricultural output more than doubled, and steel production increased sharply. If true, it is an impressive record for this land that bulks a third larger than these United States with more than three times as many people. The statistics are almost as impressive as the harsh figure of 18 million Chinese believed murdered by the communists to reach these goals. This blood-red side of the ledger may be one reason why Beiping does not allow Western newsmen inside the huge Marxist preserve, except on rare occasions. Our State Department in Washington cleared in 1957 and again in 1959 31 American correspondents for travel in China, but Beiping has refused them admittance. We, in turn, retaliate by refusing Chinese communist newsmen admittance to the United States. In addition, over the years, the few reporters from the West who have been admitted to China have found a second visit blocked unless they were friendly to the communist line. This, then, is why Western newsmen go to Hong Kong, the listening post of the East, to get the China story. At the southern end of the long red China coastline, the British crown colony of Hong Kong, a tiny outpost for the West, perched precariously at China's back door. Here, in an area of only 391 square miles, are the refugees, the traders, the old China hands who know the latest news from the North. Most of them are congregated on Hong Kong Island and the tip of the Kowloon Peninsula, both British-governed, heavily populated. The rest are in the new territories, also British-governed, but these new territories revert to China in 37 years at the expiration of a 99-year lease. The Chinese call it Fragrant Harbor. We call it Hong Kong, a trading center for the Far East for more than 100 years. Below the famed peak lies Victoria City and the magnificent Natural Harbor. To the north are Kowloon, the new territories, and the mountains of China. Some 80 years ago, a traveler to the Far East wrote, in Hong Kong, there is ever a great coming and going of people. Today, more than three million persons live here, more than a million of them refugees from China, and three million transients enter and leave the colony each year. About 1% of the residents are British, the rest Chinese. They live cheek by jowl, jammed into the only square miles of terrain suitable for building, creating a population density 16 times that of New York's Manhattan. To make matters even worse, the population is increasing at the rate of more than 150,000 a year, swollen by a heavy birth rate and the steady influx of new refugees from China. The result is a frantic search for space and a constant jostling for jobs and trade. Without trade, Hong Kong would perish. Trade it does. A torrent of goods and valuables pours in and out, most by sea, but some, with China, overland by rail. 
A fast diesel makes the 25-mile trip from Hong Kong Harbor to the frontier in less than an hour, crossing the flats of the new territories. The train stops at the British side at the railroad bridge at Lo Wu. Some of these people are businessmen traveling to Canton. Others are paying a visit to families still in China, called back by birth or death or simple filial affection. A few may be going back to their birthplace for Qing Ming, the annual ceremony of sweeping their ancestors' graves. Most are poor, but they come loaded down with items like pork and noodles. One woman said, it gets worse every time I go back. I want to cry, but I cannot let my family starve. The communist government of China, plagued by food shortages, does not object. Beyond the red flag, communist China. And there is movement, constant movement, a traffic that is a mixture of tragedy and hope at Lo Wu. ABC reporter Ray Fork found the man who sees it all. Superintendent of British Frontier Police, D.E.W. O'Brien. Superintendent O'Brien, why is this area banned to the general public? Well, we are now standing at Lo Wu Railway Station, which is situated 25 miles from the urban area of Kowloon. <coughs> Lo Wu is the actual immigration crossing point on the common frontier with China. The frontier with China extends for a distance of 22 miles running east between the Lokmachau marshes and to Sato Kok on the extreme east. The area is restricted by the, the Hong Kong government and only the residents of the area are permitted inside. This closed area extends one mile in depth from the actual frontier line and anybody who wishes to come in here has to obtain the authority of the Commissioner of Police. Do you have much, if any, trouble along the border? No, the border generally is quite a quiet little, little spot and uh, although we get some minor incidents we do not generally have a lot of trouble here at all. How many people come across each day? Well, there, on, the whole, on the average, there are approximately 1,000 people moving into and fr back from China every day. These people travel up on trains from Kowloon, but these trains do not actually cross the border line. The trains stop at Lo Wu, at this station, and the people alight here and walk across into China. Similarly, the trains coming from Canton to the station immediately on the other side of the border, Sam Chun, also alight on the Chinese side of the border and walk across into Lo Wu Station. There are some trains which do actually cross over the border. These in the main <coughs> are the freight trains <coughs> bringing goods uh, from China into Hong Kong. Well, what type of documents are needed? Uh, to travel from here to China, the resident of Hong Kong purely needs what is known as a Hong Kong re-entry permit. This is a permit issued to anyone who has a Hong Kong identity card and <coughs> enables them to travel backwards and forwards to China as often as they like during a period of 12 months. Of course, the only, there are other types of passengers traveling to China. Uh, these are uh, people traveling on passports and visas. People leaving China um, we do have an immigration quota system working at Lo Wu and we only allow 50 people to enter the colony from China each day on Chinese re-entry permits. At Lo Wu, an enigma for a Westerner, thousands of Chinese are returning home. Why? One reason. In Indonesia, where there is a Chinese community of two and a half million, the overseas Chinese are charged with controlling the economy and have been subjected to severe trading strictures. The result? Economic ruin for thousands and migration back to the mainland. As they return, they are greeted by the incessant blare of propaganda, exhorting them to give their all for Mao Zedong and the motherland.
At Lo Wu, Western reporters get only part of the Red China story. The next stop, a return to Hong Kong. Aboard is ABC reporter Walter Peters to interview those who have just left China. Some have carefully planned not to return. One man told why he decided to seek sanctuary in the South. Yes, it is true that the communists have constructed factories and the railroads and the steel mills. But they have done nothing for the people. It is difficult to judge the strength of the communist government. But as I saw no sign of uh, revolt at this time. Personally, I came to Hong Kong because I could no longer stand the communists. I'm looking for freedom. Refugees can reveal only part of the Chinese communist jigsaw puzzle. At the Associated Press in Hong Kong, Bureau Chief Forrest Edwards tells Ray Fork how he fits the pieces Mr. together. Have you been trying to get into communist China? Like all American newspaper men in Hong Kong, yes. Uh, we've all tried to get in, and uh, none of us have made it so far. In my case, I made my first application when I was transferred to Hong Kong uh, about two and a half years ago. You put in your application for a visa. I put it in several times. I've had uh, no response whatsoever, no acknowledgement of the application, as a matter of fact. Uh, this is uh, the general situation with all the rest of the correspondents. I don't know of any of them who have actually gotten any formal acknowledgement of their application for a visa. Then how do you cover the China story? Covering the China story from Hong Kong is like looking through a window. Hong Kong is the window, sometimes a little cloudy. Uh, there are three main ways that we try to find out what's going on in China. One is the uh, radio, the Red Chinese radio, which uh, we listen to, which we monitor, uh, which carries a lot of uh, stories, both internal and external, of Chinese news. The second way is through the Red Chinese uh, newspapers and magazines. Uh, we get many of their newspapers. Here's one that just came in today. This is Peking People's Daily. Uh, we get that daily. We also get the magazine. This is one called China Reconstructs. Uh, our translators, we have a staff of translators and also other agencies have translators. They go through this looking for the hard news that uh, contained in it. But frankly, we have to read several thousand words to get uh, a paragraph or so that uh, we consider hard news. That is, hard news is, is differentiated from the uh, communist uh, uh, line. The third way is through interviewing uh, those Westerners who are able to go into uh, China on visits some French businessmen, some English businessmen, a few German businessmen, interviewing them when they come out, and also, of course, interviewing the refugees who make their way to Hong Kong after fleeing China. From Radio Beiping, a constant barrage of propaganda. Monitors work day and night, taking it all down. Red China's rewrite of history. In all history, no nation has had a more honorable record in its relations with other countries than has the United States. History, however, cannot be erased at Eisenhower's will. From 1948 to 1958, the United States committed aggression in Latin America on 48 occasions and engineered 14 major coup d'etats to create pro-American dictatorial regimes. In the past year or more, the United States has been engaged in sabotage, attempts at subversion, economic theft, and even outright military intervention. Its armed forces occupying the Panama Canal Zone opened fire on Panama patriots who only sought to recover their own territory. On top of that, the United States has now sent thousands of troops to prop up the crumbling Dominican dictatorship. The broad masses of the Latin American people are well aware of the historical record of U.S. imperialism. 
At the Union Press Building, one of the many translation services in Hong Kong, a deceptive quiet. Here are received the Chinese provincial newspapers, which reveal much of what goes on inside China. They are carefully read, then ironed for photostatic. Some of these papers must be smuggled out of China, bring as high as $7 a copy from newsmen trying to get a balanced picture of life behind the bamboo curtain. Some of the news about China is fed to the world by the official Chinese Communist News Agency, Xinhua, located in one of Hong Kong's more modern buildings. From Xinhua comes the official party line, and most editors ignore the content of its daily file, except for the official government announcements. The Communist Party of Hong Kong publishes three daily newspapers. One that lays down the official communist line, another, a mass circulation paper aimed at Hong Kong workers, and still another, an afternoon newspaper for Hong Kong's intellectuals. Several of Hong Kong's bookstores are openly or covertly operated by the communists. These push sales of communist books and magazines, glorifying the life and loves of China's dedicated workers. Then there are the theaters, like the cafe. A Western newsman looking for other pieces in the communist puzzle can queue up with the Hong Kong Chinese crowds for some glowing reports filmed by the communists in China, boasting of the progress being made in Red China, and all of it accompanied by glowing communist narration. Inside, the screen lights up. The Chinese people are achieving with their own hands a miracle never witnessed before. Members of the agricultural cooperative are creating with every possible means all types of earth-carrying tools. These are earth-carrying rollers. These are carting air run on pulleys. No matter how high the hills, how deep the rivers, they cannot forestall the advancing footsteps of the Chinese people. We are going to let rivers fly across and go up high mountains. Till now, the irrigation work completed throughout the country will bring water to an additional area of more than 270 million mu of land. Many of China's hilly and mountainous areas suffer frequent threat of drought. Now, in the wide countryside, a great drive to build irrigation works has unfolded. Its aim is to overcome natural disasters and ensure a record harvest this year. This is a scene in Shanxi province. The agricultural cooperative has determined to make the water go uphill. A project like this, on such a big scale, and accompanied by so many difficulties, can only be accomplished 
by organization. The more people take part, the easier the work. The more united the force, the more effective it is. Working like this, the drain follows the path of the water. In a few months' work, this cooperative has built a drain 14 li in length to irrigate over 700 mo of land. A heavy machine tool factory is being built in Heilongjiang province in northeast China. working high above the ground in a rigid cold of over 30 degrees centigrade below zero and they will finish up with the entire mountain job by July this year. This factory specializes in the production of different kinds of giant sized machine tools. In China's southwest area, another newly built railway was formally inaugurated. The railway runs from Baoji to Chengdu and is 668 kilometers long. More than 900 bridges were spanned along the line and over 300 tunnels dug. The Baoji Chengdu Railway connects the southwest and northwest with the entire country. This is a momentous event in the economic life of the Chinese people. New buses are being designed and built in a Shanghai plant. The body of the new bus is built over the chassis of the liberation lorries made in the new automobile factory in Changchun. The new buses have good clean lines in design. They are lighter in weight than imported buses and have longer life and greater passenger capacity. Ticket seller and passengers alike have comfortable seats. The new buses are a further improvement for the transportation system of this modern metropolis. Now let us take a look of the sanitary conditions. Each household mops and washes inside out at regular intervals to remain clean all along. the head of the street residence committee. She has a high sense of responsibility in sanitary inspection and bears a warm attitude towards everyone so that residents in her area all respect her. Health and sanitation work is also underway in the rural area. This is an ordinary village in Guangdong province. They have already acquired habits of cleanliness and hygiene.
There is a vast desert extending in China's northwest. For thousands of years, this area has always been uninhabited, but now it has changed to a different aspect. This year, more than 5,000 oil prospecting personnel, forming over a hundred prospecting teams, advanced towards the deserts on the north and south of the Tianshan Range. They have raised the slogan, Go all over Drangor and drill all through the Gobi Desert. They want to find out all the underground wells which can be of service to our motherland. One oil barrack after another marks the regeneration of the extensive desert. When it gets to 1962, this oil field will become an oil base yielding 3 million tons of petroleum per year. You have just seen film from Communist China with narration prepared by the party's propaganda apparatus. There is no question that China has made material progress since the Communists gained control in 1949. But the film you've just seen says nothing about the cost, the cost in human dignity, in human lives. Religion has been attacked with Christian priests and Buddhist monks driven out of their churches and temples and jailed. Rebellion has flared in spots across the land and communist troops are reported engaged now in crushing a full-scale revolt in Tibet, the second revolt in 15 months. The communists have belatedly admitted that a revolt against their rule in Singhai province in 1959 resulted in the massacre of an unknown number of people and widespread destruction of pasture livestock and homes. They also now admit that in 1959 the fiercely independent Mongols in Xinjiang province formed an anti-communist army and fomented open revolt resulting in the execution of 90,000 Mongols. The cost in human dignity and in human life has been high. Listening Post East resumes in just a moment. Listening Post East with John Daly. In Hong Kong, American correspondents wait in vain for visas that will admit them to China. Others, like the British, face interminable delays, but in waiting, they are busy interviewing, probing, watching for any indication that the Chinese communists may have reached too far in their quick demonic drive to power. One of the reporters, is Wendell Merrick, Bureau Chief of United Press International. He talks to ABC's Ray Falk. From your reports, what are the economic conditions in China? Well, China has had a reasonably successful 1959. Uh, steel production uh, is up, if we can believe their own statistics. <clears throat> Grain production is down by uh, a few million tons. Cotton production is roughly uh, what they expected. Now, last August, they revised their 1959 estimates. And when I say that steel production is up, it's above what they um, said they anticipated would be their 1959 production on the basis of those August uh, revisions. The same applies to grain and uh, to cotton and to other commodities. Basically, uh, the uh, Chinese economic position uh, is uh, not too strong because of the lack of foreign exchange. Uh, also the fact that the, the principal imports must come from the communist bloc, uh, who, as <coughs> best as we can determine, impose some rather hard, uh, harsh uh, uh, conditions to trade. Uh, their loans, uh, the uh, Russians have given Red China approximately 450 million US dollars uh, worth of uh, goods. 
the rest of the communist bloc in Europe, uh, I'm not sure of the exact figure, but it probably uh, comes close to that. But it's a really a drop in the bucket for a nation which has 650 million people. How about the Chinese army? The army, of course, is, is somewhat <coughs> um, annoyed, uh, uh, possibly the best word. Uh, number one, because they've been used uh, as a police force. Uh, they've been used even to uh, till the soil, uh, to uh, harvest crops, which is hardly the duty of uh, the army. Uh, they've had to grow their own food in many instances. Now this has meant that the army has not been able to train its personnel to the extent that they would like to. Uh, also, they have not gotten the modern weapons that they had been either promised or thought they would get in due course <coughs> because of Peking's preoccupation with uh, expanding heavy and light industry. You can only buy so many pieces of equipment and uh, military weapons apparently uh, have not had top priority. This doesn't mean that they're a weak military nation by any means. They have uh, anywhere from two to 3,000 uh, first class uh, jet fighters and bombers. Uh, they have uh, anywhere from two to four million uh, experienced uh, soldiers. Their Navy, of course, uh, is practically non-existent, except for uh, one or two uh, old frigates, uh, gunboats, uh, a few um, American-built landing barges. Uh, that's about it. The Army would like to take a more active voice in uh, politics, but it might have been uh, made quite clear in, in recent months by uh, the Central Committee that the Army is merely an instrument by which the Central Committee of the Communist Party uh, get its directives carried out, and that the army itself it does not uh, have a positive say in formulation of policy. The picture of China, present and future, is further filled out by other Western reporters in Hong Kong who keep an endless wait for admission to China. Two of them are old China hands, one an American, the other a British subject. Tillman Durden of the New York Times knew China under the nationalists before and after World War II, but has been forced to report on China from Hong Kong since the communist takeover. Richard Hughes of the London Sunday Times got a first-hand look at the Red Regime less than three years ago and has been waiting since to return. First, Mr. Durton. The feeling I get about communist China from Hong Kong is that um, it is very much a going concern. The Peking regime has uh, achieved a very impressive economic buildup at a very heavy cost to the people. It has become uh, a, an industrial power of considerable weight in the world. The regime is substantially unified. It has an army that uh, gives it effective support. And it seems to be here to stay for quite a long time. We have now seen, last year, the worst drought, the worst combination of natural calamities in the history of China, so they say. Let us say, if we like, for the last 20 years. Drought, flood, and typhoon. We used to talk in the old days of there being famines in which millions of Chinese died. Now, at least, whatever terrible tyrannies are happening inside China, at least nobody is dying on that large scale of hunger or of hardship. These are hard things to realize when we take Western standards to what is happening inside China. We must, I repeat, uh, consider the Chinese conditions as they existed before the coming of the communists. And while the conditions which for us, as Westerners, are impossible to, uh, to contemplate, we must consider them in terms of comparison with the Chinese communists. And uh, in communist China, uh, communism is still not a completely consolidated system. They feel insecure. They feel insecure vis-a-vis -vis the United States. They feel that way down east, underneath, there are a lot of Chinese uh, who think of the United States and its system as an alternative. That's one reason, uh, one basic uh, ideological reason why Peking is so hostile to the United States. Another uh, is the fact that uh, we protect Taiwan. Uh, Communist China regards Taiwan as a part of Chinese territory, and uh, 
we prevent them from taking it. This arouses their antagonism. There are many other reasons. The United States had strong influence in, in China before communists, the communists took over. And this influence represents uh, still a latent threat to the regime and Peking must be hostile to us and hostile to this influence in order to consolidate its power. It's really necessary to oversimplify, it seems to be naturally, talking about your visits to China. The circumstances are that it is not a comparison between China today and the West of today, it's a comparison between China of today and China of yesterday. By that standard, the most extraordinary and continuing physical and material improvements are being made inside China on a degree and a standard which has to be seen to be believed. To the extent to which individual freedoms and liberties are suffering as a result is a matter for the Western mind to be worried about and I am sure not for most of the Chinese. Which makes me emphasize the point again that to consider or dream about a possible collapse or overthrow of the present regime in China is most absurd nonsense, dangerous nonsense. It is not likely to happen. The influence of communism in China is going to spread throughout Asia, in my opinion. The ancient Chinese sampan, now a means of escape to the south. The escapees know the penalty if they are caught by the Reds, imprisonment or death. But still they come, running the Red gunboat blockade to freedom. They find a haven in Hong Kong's tightly packed floating villages of sampans and junks. Conditions are crowded in these coves and bays, but it is a home. Rent is free and it is better than they knew last week or last year. Literally thousands of these families, large and small, have fled to safety in Hong Kong in the nearby Portuguese port of Macau, which is also a haven for refugees. More than a thousand turned up in one month. Here they make what they can, fishing, occasionally farm seaweed along the muddy shore. Most importantly, they are free from the hated state collective in China that keeps 80% of their fish catch. Life is lived aboard. The young will die barely knowing the feeling of land beneath their feet. Here, there are two fears the typhoons that chase them back to port empty-handed from their fishing grounds at sea, and then the fear that their prayers for a full bowl of rice will go unheeded. High in the hills and ravines of Hong Kong, jerry-built shacks of burlap, tin, and tar paper, homes for hundreds of thousands of refugees. Space is at a premium in Hong Kong, rent is high, and the poor flood into the squatter settlements 2,000 to the acre of land. Children are everywhere, many lucky to have a crowded shack to call home. Hong Kong officials estimate that 50,000 children have none and use for their bed the streets. Still, childish laughter is irrepressible. Families of five and six may share one flimsy shanty with whatever goats, pigs, and chickens they're lucky enough to possess. Refugees contend with a shortage of water, use kerosene or candles for light, and their diet consists mostly of vegetables. During the day, when there is sunlight, there are games to ward off boredom and despair. Here, as in the Sampan village, there is fear of the typhoon and of fire, and on Christmas night, 1953, it came roaring through the squatter settlement of Shek Kip Mai, with devastating speed, clearing 45 acres in a cataclysm of flame. Hong Kong was stunned. It was the worst disaster ever to hit the city, more than matching in fury last week's typhoon that ripped Hong Kong with 135 mile an hour winds, killing more than 45 and injuring hundreds. In this fire of 1953, 60,000 men, women, and children were left homeless and hungry. 
something had to be done for the children and their parents. The British government of Hong Kong took a bold step. For the moment, it set up massive kitchens, issued warm clothing, and cared for the sick. Then, just 53 days after the catastrophe, on the site that had been burned out, the first of a host of concrete apartment houses was complete. By the end of 1959, more than 300,000 refugees had been resettled in these six and seven story developments. By Western standards, they are crowded, but they are fireproof. Rent is just a few dollars a month. There is electric lighting, sewage disposal, clinics for the sick, and for a change, fresh air and sunlight. There is new life here and greater hope, and then two neighbors lend a helping hand when it's needed. On the rooftops are playgrounds and schools where children regain some of the bright burnish of youth lost in the escape to the free world. Not all of Hong Kong's refugees live in government tenements. One-story cottage homes have mushroomed over Hong Kong's rugged terrain. Land was provided by the British government. Construction costs were met by religious and relief organizations. Several thousand refugee families live in these smaller homes. And here at Bishop Ford Center, there is plenty of room to play. The child, they say, is the father of the man. In Hong Kong, the child is also the yeast in a continuing population explosion. The problem, how to harness this force before it drives the colony to the level of bare subsistence or into the arms of communism. That part of our story after this brief message. The Christian prays for his daily bread. The Chinese prays that his rice bowl be full. It is not a perfunctory prayer. Famine, as you've heard, has been known to wipe out millions in less than a year when drought was hard on the mainland. The fear of starvation is acquired at birth, and the refugees carry this fear with them as they escape from Red China. In Hong Kong, the need is still acute. Each day, thousands queue up for rice, noodles, occasionally a bit of meat. The British colonial government and more than 40 private and religious organizations team up to lend a helping hand, providing food for those who cannot help themselves. The problem becomes almost staggering when you hear official estimates that half a million persons still live in Hong Kong shanties in dire poverty, but they have hope. Food brings energy, and energy brings the enterprise to find a job. New factories spring up as a boom in light industry gets underway. Historically, Hong Kong's economy has been based on trade. With the communist takeover on the mainland and the Allied embargo on traffic with the communists, Hong Kong's trade began a steady decline. To stave off economic strangulation, the colony was forced to develop industry, and the machines began to hop. Textile products are king, sell around the world at prices below even those of Japan. But enamelware, aluminumware, and plastics are growing industries. Labor is willing and cheap, a top of $3 a day for the skill. The owner of this plant is a refugee, Lorenzo Lowe. He tells Ray Fork of how it feels to be riding the crest of a boom. Mr. Lowe, how's business? Well, we can't complain. Business has been pretty good to us this year. The market has been expanding, and this is a new factory that's been set up, really, to meet the increased demand for garments from Hong Kong. How did you get into the textile business? My say it was really quite accidental. You know, we refugees who come down to Hong Kong, we do what we can, we turn our hand to whatever is available, and the textile and garment business have been two of the booming businesses here. And that's how I got into it. I drifted into it. Are all these girls refugees? Well, some of them certainly are. They're all Cantonese. Some of them are native-born in Hong Kong, and quite a number of them are from the mainland. Many of them still have the, their homes and families on the mainland. So, but the exact proportion between refugees and native-born Hong Kong, I don't know. We don't look at it that way. Are all the refugee businessmen as, as successful as you? Well, on the whole, I would say that the businessmen who came down from the north have done very well. I may have been luckier than some, but 
the boom and the prosperity of Hong Kong has certainly been built up by, to a very great extent, by the uh, businessmen that have come in as refugees from the north. Well, how do you explain the Hong Kong boom? The boom have, have had many factors, but I would say the main factor of the boom has been the people. The people who have come out from the mainland and the people who are resident in Hong Kong. Hardworking, industrious, and people who have come out here to start a new life, who had the initiative and the enterprise and the desire to be a little more free and to live in a way that they want to live rather than the way they're told to live. How does it feel to have your business so close to the communist border? Well, we don't think too much about it. We carry on from day to day and hope for the best, but we think we're quite safe here for the time being. Throughout the day, the sound of pile drivers as the building boom continues underway. Wealthier refugees provide much of the money, the poorer ones the muscle of manual labor for less than a dollar a day. Land is at a premium, must be hacked out of the hills or reclaimed from the sea. There also are plans for satellite towns in the more sparsely settled new territories. One reclamation project is planned for a place once named Gin Drinkers Bay, now changed to the more prosaic Kwe Chung. The buildings rise toward the sky, great shipping, trading, and banking houses that make Hong Kong a commercial center of the Orient, the Manhattan of the East. One of Hong Kong's newest buildings is owned and operated by Chinese communists, and it is occupied by the China Products Company. It is one of the busiest department stores in Hong Kong. It is the showplace for communist Chinese goods. Although China desperately needs her consumer goods at home, she has expanded her exports to get currency and to impress the West. Most of these goods are dumped at cut rate prices, but the Reds still make a profit. Wage rates in communist China are minuscule, and in the state collectives and communes, there are no stockholders demanding dividends. Beyond Cavill, Hong Kong is booming and a rich pride. Why don't the communists move in and take over? Ray Fork gets the answer from Ketang Wu. Mr. Wu is the editor of the English language Hong Kong Standard. Now, the communists have been rather aggressive recently, yet they've left Hong Kong alone. How do you explain that? Well, Hong Kong, of course, is very important to them as a uh, place where they can get a large volume of foreign exchange and the need for an exchange. Uh, this is also the base where they can handle their exports to Southeast Asia. They channel quite a uh, portion of the export products uh, through Hong Kong. This is a city where they send out their workers and agents into Southeast Asia and the Middle East. Uh, for one thing, I uh, just want to cite that as an example. Uh, the people in Hong Kong buy every day approximately one million uh, dollars worth, Hong Kong dollars worth, of vegetables alone. Uh, that's quite a bit of money. Uh, if they took this place over, they would just be feeding Hong Kong with no extra income. Hong Kong, a gigantic warehouse and funnel for trade between East and West, with one of the busiest harbors in the world. Despite a sharp decrease in trade with China, Ships from the mainland still pull in, loaded with food to feed Hong Kong. The communists, meantime, see trade as the keystone to power and have quadrupled their world exports in 10 years. Within cannon shot of these docks, China lashes her people on for the glory of the motherland. The theme is, man in the multitude is strong. Man alone is weak. But even the young need some individual sense of self and when regimentation becomes too severe, some of them quietly escape and come here. I can't speak to you, because my home is in the 
I do not want to show my face because I still have a family in China. I left China two and a half years ago. I told them I wanted to visit a sick relative. I still receive letters from my family, but the letters say very little. But my mother always asks for food, and I send her butter and dried fish. Sometimes I send cheese, and sometimes biscuits and candy, also cooked pork. My mother has told me nothing about one of my brothers. I had to learn from friends who escaped that he is dead. His body was found in the river with a bullet. I am told he was killed because he tried to escape. Many times I hear communist radio, and it tells about the great progress. But they are building new dams, railroads, and new factories. But what good is it to have all this if the mind cannot live in peace? The ideal of peace, so elusive yet as permanently embedded in the fabric of man as the need for worship or for food. At times, it is voiced in a girl's quiet plea, but it may yet again swell into a wild crescendo, bursting the bonds of those who still are not free. In the early days of our nation, following the Battle of Bunker Hill, Daniel Webster said, if the true spark of liberty be kindled, it will burn. Human agency cannot extinguish it. Like the Earth's central fire, it may be smothered for a time. The ocean may overwhelm it. Mountains may press it down. But its inherent and unconquerable force will heave both the ocean and land. And at some time or other, in some place or other, the volcano will break out and flame up to heaven. To this thought, China's communist masters might well pay heed. Good night and a good tomorrow. Listening Post East. Narrated by John Daly. Producer, Walter Peters. Director, Marshall Diskin. Technical Director, William Dagenhart. Associate Director, Jock Matten. Special Writer, Graham Grove. ABC Correspondent, Ray Falk. Film Editors, Walter Essenfeld, Jerry Montano, Nils Rasmussen. Don Dowd speaking. Listening Post, East, has been a presentation of ABC News.